Good morning and welcome to our Sunday service here at Faith Baptist Church. I wish I could say it's good to see you, but you are not here and you are at home. And I look forward to when I can say I, uh, it's good to see you, but it's good to be able to come into your living room or kitchen or wherever you may be and at least give you some, some uh, messages that will be a help to you, I hope, on this Sunday. And, um, and I also wanted to, uh, we made an announcement that we were going to have an Easter service outdoors, but uh, last night or yesterday, we had an announcement by the governor of our state that he has put in place an order to stay at home. And so that means that we will not be able to have our Easter service outdoors. Now, it would be, I, I was so excited. And it would have been great. The walkers would have pulled up their trailer here and put out a stage, and we'd have had singing and uh, preaching, and we'd have had, we'd have been taking offerings, take three, four, five offerings, and we would have had the time of our life. And I was so excited. And and then we have these speakers. We could have put those. We're going to put those out there, and people all over could have heard it. And we've got these both speakers. Man, they could hear us all the way to Kansas probably with these speakers. But unfortunately and sadly, um, we're not going to be able to do that. Um, and so that actually that order is going to be put in place on Monday at 12 a.m. in the morning. And that is going to go until the 24th of April. And that, is, that of course, could change. But, uh, but obviously, we're going to do what our governor says to do. And, and with that, I'd just like to say... Uh, I do not believe that this is an infringement on our constitutional rights nor our biblical rights as a citizen or as a church. Um, I believe that our governor and our government are trying to do this for the benefit of our, of our health and safety of our congregation and also our, um, our community. I, I know Governor Parsons, we uh, would take the boys from Agape up there every year, and we would visit the Capitol, and the boys would sing up there. And uh, go, uh, the, Senator Parsons, actually at that time, uh, would always make it a point to come and visit with the boys and talk to the boys. Um, he is a saved man, as I said. Um, and he would take a time to encourage the boys because he has a, a past that was a little was a bit rough, and so he always tried to encourage them, be a help to them. And I appreciated that that he would take the time out of his busy schedule to do that. And so I, I believe that he's trying to do the very best that he can as a governor. I cannot even imagine the pressure that he is under, especially now when so many of the states have gone this way. And whether you think it's right or wrong is not the issue right now. Um, you've heard the saying, um, you know, don't, don't criticize a man until you have walked a mile in his shoes. And I believe that is certainly applicable here. Um, our governor is just doing what he deems is best. And I believe he cares about the citizens of the state of Missouri. And so the best thing to do, I believe, is instead of criticizing him, I think we should be praying for him, uh, praying for all of our leaders, and also our president, of course, and, the ca and those that are, are his ca uh, counselors, uh, our, uh, our Surgeon General, um, all those that are involved in this, in the health aspect of it. And I, boy, I, I've heard all kind of stuff, and some are talking conspiracies, and some are talking about that um, this is the government trying to take the church out. I, 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 honestly, at this point, I don't know, and I really don't believe that. And I believe that um, they are just trying to do what's best for us. Now, if the government said that we can't have church because of what we believe and because of our stand on the Bible, and this is Saturday, and if they told us that on Saturday, I promise you I would be behind this pulpit, I would still be preaching, or if I couldn't get into the church service, I'd go somewhere outside and I'd hold a service there. But I do not believe that this is an infringement at all on those rights. Now, something could happen. It, it may be down the road. I don't know. Um, but I am saying that I believe we ought to abide by this. I believe Romans chapter 13 is still in the Bible. 
and I intend to do what the Bible says. And I thank you for your encouraging words. I thank you for your encouraging texts. And I also thank you for your giving. Thank you for those that have uh, sent in your, um, your tithes and your offerings, those of you that have come by and dropped those off, and then those of you that have done it on the website. Now, because of this stay at home, it would probably be much better if, if, you, would, if you can, if, and if you feel comfortable in doing that, is going ahead and giving through our website. We have under a banner, it says PayPal, and then under that it says online giving. Um, if you could do it that way, that would certainly be a blessing. Boy, we need to keep supporting the church. Um, we still have bills to pay. We have salaries. We have our lease and hopefully our mortgage in, in a few weeks. So please, please, please be sure to be faithful when you give. And you have been. And it has been very, very encouraging. Now, if you do use the PayPal on our website, would you please, I believe there's a space on there where you can say what it is designated for, be it the general offering, be it your tithes, be it missions, or be it for the camera, whatever it may be, if you would designate that, that would be a tremendous help. And then also you can mail that in. Um, uh, and we'll of course make sure the mail is picked up probably every day. Um, as far as now, I don't know that we can have you come by and drop it off, but if anything changes, I will be sure to give you that information. I'll probably end up texting it to you through our church mobile text network. Um, also, with that said, if you would like to join our church mobile uh, network, all you have to do is text the word REDEMPTION, capital R, REDEMPTION, and then you text that to the number 662-200-4303. Once again, 662-200-4303. Four three zero three, and it will be added to the church network. And if you would, when you get the reply text, if you could then text back your name again, if you want to do that, and that way, when I do get texts from people, um, I can know who that is, and um, and that will help me there. I also want to apologize that I've not sent out any more devotional texts. I have certainly enjoyed that, and I've got a lot of great feedback from that. But I found out that I only have so many texts with this program that we are on, and I used those up very quickly when I sent those, those texts. We've got over 90 subscribers on that text, and every single text adds up. And it get to the point when I started sending texts, I had to pay for each one, and it was beginning to get expensive. And so um, at this time, I'm not going to be able to do that. We're looking to maybe find another way to send those devotionals out. So I, again, I will let you know if that is possible. And then one last announcement. Um, of course, the missions conference is going to be coming up. And at this point, uh, I've talked to Brother Smith, who is our, our guest preacher. Um, and right now we're still planning to do that. That, of course, is May the 3rd through the 6th, and we are going to ha hopefully have that, but if anything changes, we'll let you know. Please, please pray about that. I'm praying that we'll be able to get right back on track here in May and get things going as they were going. So just letting you know, uh, right now it, we're, we're on, on board with that thing. But again, if that changes, I will let you know. All right, well, let's get into the preaching. Once again, it's great to be able to come to you this way. Hope the message is a blessing to you. And once again, preaching to an empty church. And once again, my only one here is Brother Joe Walker. And appreciate him taking the time out of his busy schedule and doing this. And so take your Bibles, please, and turn over to the book of Hebrews, to the book of Hebrews in chapter number 13. And we'll be reading two verses here, Hebrews chapter 13 and verses 5 and 6. Verses 5 and 6. And you can read along with me if you want to. You can stand there. I know some folks are actually having a church service in your home. And if that is the case, and you can stand in Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 5, read along with me if you'd like. Let your conversation, that is your lifestyle, of course, be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. 
so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. Notice the next statement now. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. That word fear, I've heard that word quite a bit in these last few weeks concerning this pandemic and concerning the economy. And I think I've used that word to describe the emotions of people in our country more than any other word. Other words like anxiety, concerns, those are words that are used, but fear is the one I've heard the most. And let's face it, a lot of people have fear. Fear of getting the pandemic, and by the way, there are some people that have gotten this thing and, um, and uh, have died, and this thing is a killer. That, that is a fact. And there are people that are fearful about getting it. And there are people fearful about their own personal finances. People have lost their jobs, and uh, people are not able to go to work. Businesses have had to shut down. I'm thinking of businesses right here in Stockton that they're, you know, they're, they're pretty much closed down. And um, some of them are doing takeout, but for the most uh, part, they're closed down. And now after the stay at home, it's going to probably get even more so. And so the word fear is certainly a very uh, prevalent word today. But I want to talk to you about this subject. I want to talk to you about overcoming fear. I want to talk to you about overcoming fear. So if you would, please, let's bow our heads, close our eyes. And let's pray. Father, I pray that you would right now begin to work on anyone that is being overcome by fear. Now, Lord, fear is a natural thing, and in some ways it's a healthy thing. But, Lord, if it hinders us, if it stops us from doing what we need to do, then it's not a good thing. And so my prayer is that I could help us today to get some truth that would help us to overcome our fears. In Jesus' name. Amen. I've read that psychologists tell us that we are actually born with two fears. And this was interesting to me. Those two fears are the fear of falling and the fear of noise. But of course, after that, as we grow up in life, we soon begin to develop many more fears. Um, so by the way, some of those fears, we get those from our parents, we get those from people in our life. I think if you kind of went back and analyzed that thing, you'll find parents that, you know, some of the same, the fears that you have are the same fears that your children will have. They say that, mem that they, they were saying that members of a psychology class asked 500 people, what are you afraid of? And this is almost hard for me to believe, but those 500 people listed 7,000 fears. And I got to thinking, how, man, 7,000 fears, that's a lot of fears. But it proves to us that people can be overcome with fear. They, and this was also interesting. About 50 years or so ago, they found that, uh, that children, grade school children, had um, five greatest fears. And here, listen to what they were. The five greatest fears of children um, over 50 years ago was number one, animals. I don't know if that's, this is in order of what is greatest. Animals, uh, being in a dark room. Uh, I must confess when I was in grade school, I was afraid of the dark and always had to have that closet light on a little bit. And, um, and then high places, strangers, and loud noises. Now this is revealing. They took this test not too long ago, and here's what they found, the greatest fears of grade school kids now. Number one, uh, number one divorce. Number two, nuclear war. Number three, cancer. Number four, pollution. And number five, being beat up, being mugged. I read that to you to, to let you know this. Fear is a powerful emotion at times in our life. In fact, I know you would agree with this, sometimes fear is an overwhelming emotion in our life. I read this, one writer wrote this about fear. Fear causes more misery than all the sin and sickness of our lives combined. Now, the truth is, we're not sick all the time. And I hope this isn't the case, but we don't sin all the time. But, but many of us have some fear in our life 
all the time. Maybe fear of something coming up. It may be the fear of somebody. It may be a fear of some things that are going on in your life even now. But the truth is, fear is something that is often in our life all the time. Now, there are three kinds of fears that we need to identify. The first fear we need to identify is the fear of God. By the way, that's a good fear. And really, it's not actually fear. But though it is called the fear of God. Fear in the Bible is actually um, uh, reverence, it is honor, it is respect. That is when we say that person has the fear of God. It means they revere God. It means they respect God. It means they honor God. In fact, it could also mean that they love God. In the case of Abraham, I believe that's what God meant uh, when Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son Isaac on that altar. And just when he was going to bring that knife down on his son Isaac, the angel stopped him. And the angel said, now I know that you fear God. And I believe he was saying there, I know not only you revere, you respect, you honor God, but Abraham, I know you love God. And the, and the thing about the fear of God, it is the fear of God that actually causes us to obey God. The Bible actually commands us here in Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and then, and keep the commandments for this is the whole duty of man. So the fear of God, this fear leads us to obey the commands of God and life. Then there is the fear that is a protective fear. It is a preventive fear. And this is a good fear. This is a great fear. This protects us from danger. Like the fear that a child, probably after they've already done it once, but the fear that a child has of touching a hot stove. Now some kids don't, uh, don't know that it's, uh, uh, touching a hot stove is going to burn their finger, so they may touch it one time, but I guarantee you they never touch it again. And that's a good healthy fear. Or maybe the fear of reaching out and uh, petting an animal, a barking dog or something. But, but you get what I mean. There are some fears that are great fears and they protect us and they prevent things from happening in our life. But then the fear that I want to talk to you about is the fear that hinders us. And I'm talking about fear. Fear um, uh, can paralyze us physically. In other words, it keeps us from doing uh, good things. Uh, there are so many phobias, and I could go through a list of the craziest phobias that people have. Um, but one of the phobias is some people have a fear of flying. I know a man that will never fly. If he, if he has to, he'll never leave this country because to leave this country, to go to say Europe or over in Asia, he'll never go because he is not getting on a plane. If he's going to go somewhere, he is going to drive there or take a bus there or take a train there. And, let's, uh, and some people have that fear. And there are other phobias that keep people from doing things. But the fear that we really need to be careful of is the fear that spiritually keeps us from doing things or causes us to do things. Sadly, there is a fear that keeps us from exercising our faith. Sadly, there is a fear that keeps us from fulfilling our responsibility in doing the will of God. Sadly, there is a fear that keeps us from serving God. Sadly, there is a fear that keeps us from being a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is a fear that keeps us, causes us to do the wrong thing. I think about Abraham. Uh, when the famine came into the land, uh, Abraham, instead of trusting God like he should have trusted God, Abraham went to Egypt. And of course, you know the story there. That's where, they, where he picked up Hagar. And that's where he started, uh, had a son through Hagar, which became, of course, the Arabs and brought all kind of problems in that world ever since that day. So there's a fear that can cause us to do the wrong things. But the point is, fear keeps us from doing good and sometimes doing great things that we need to be doing as a child of God. In fact, the book of Proverbs talks about fear of man bringeth a snare. The fear of man bringeth a snare. Hey, fear can snare us and hold us down and keep us back. And I gotta tell you, if I didn't do things that I was afraid to do when it came to the ministry and in my own personal life, there's a lot of things I would have never done had fear, uh, had I allowed fear to 
hinder me. So this morning, I want you to see what the Bible says about overcoming fear. Um, uh, uh, primary age ch children were having a show and tell at their school one day and kids brought in all different things and there were some kids that brought in things that dealt with their religion or their faith what they believed in and so one boy came stood up and he got in front of the class and this boy said my name is Benjamin and I am Jewish and this is the star of David and then a young lady got up and she stood up and she said my name is Mary and I am uh, and I am a Roman Catholic and this is a crucifixion then after that, another boy got up, and that boy stood up in front of the class, and he said, my name is Johnny, and I am a Baptist, and this is a casserole. Boy, I tell you what, that's a, man, that's a boy after my own heart, and thank God for Baptists, amen. We believe in casseroles, and we believe in potlucks, and we believe what the Bible says, and I'm going to stand on this, and you'll never uh, convince me otherwise. I buffet my body daily. So... We see here, but here's the problem. Johnny didn't get it, did he? He didn't get it. He didn't get what really being a Baptist is. And sadly, sometimes we are just like jo Johnny. Christians are just like Johnny. They don't get it. They don't get it how they need to be living according to the Bible. That they need to be doing what the Bible says. And that's what I want to help you to do. I want you to live according to the Bible so that you can overcome fear. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse number 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power. That is the Holy Spirit power. Holy Spirit can help us to overcome fear. Um, and then he says, and of love. The Bible says, perfect love casteth out fear. And of a sound mind. You know what? Allowing the wrong things into your mind to control your mind and to live in your mind can bring fear in your life. Boy, I'm, I'm careful about watching too much news and there's so much negativity out there and so much information. This person says this, this, and this person says this. And I'm going to tell you, you start putting all that stuff in your mind, it, you're going to start to get fearful. You're going to start to get anxious. You're going to start to worry and you're going to start to fret. And we need not to be doing that. And I could give you verses to go against every single one of those things. But stop putting the wrong things in in your mind. Make sure you're getting good things in your mind. Make sure like Philippians chapter 4 verse number 8, boy think on true things the Bible says and honest things and just things and pure things and lovely things and things of good report and things that bring praise to God and I have virtue in them and sure, don't, listen I, I gotta watch it because I wanna know what's going on and, uh, but I also don't wanna be an ostrich and stick my head in the sand and not know anything. There, there's information I need to know and want to know so that I can do what's best for me and my wife and my family, but also what's best for the church. So all I'm saying is God doesn't give to us the spirit of fear, that fear that hinders us and keeps us, but we need to make sure that we're overcoming fear. I, I, I read this, this story about a leaky old ship that was out in a rough and stormy sea and they were actually these uh, the, 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 the sailors that were on that ship were getting scared and fearful that something was going to happen that storm and they didn't know whether they were going to sink or not so one of them went in to see the captain and said captain are we safe and he said well I'll put it to you this way he said the boilers on the ship are very weak and may explode at any moment he said also the ship is he said, also, uh, uh, to be very honest with you, we may have an explosion or we may sink. And then he said this, we may go up or we may go down, but at any, but at any rate, we are going on. And that's what I'm saying. I'm saying no matter what happens, life is going to go on. Even though a pandemic comes, even though the economy has all these problems, listen, life is going to go on. But the question is, are you going to go on with, uh, uh, with fear or without fear or, or in spite of fear?
in your life, in spite of fear. And let's face the fact, there's always going to be a little bit of fear in our heart when we do anything. And that's the way we should face the future. We need to face it, dear friend. We need to face it overcoming fear. So the question is, are you going to do live your life in fear or are you going to live your life in faith? So let's see what the Bible says. How can we overcome fear? Number one, number one, never lose sight of God's presence. Never lose sight of God's presence. Now, I've, uh, I've watched uh, sermons from other pastors, and uh, I've listened to things from other pastors, and one of the things that, that uh, pastors and preachers are using to encourage God's people is to remember that God is present, that God is in our life, and God is involved in the, all this, and God hasn't jumped ship, amen? Uh, God hasn't left us. God hasn't said, you know, I'm going to come back when this thing is all over. No, sir. Uh, God is omnipresent. God is omniscient. Uh, uh, God is everywhere. God knows everything, and God is omnipotent. God is all-powerful. So, we should never lose sight. Notice our scripture, Hebrews 13, verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Uh, th that has to be some of the most wonderful words in the Bible. That has to be some of the most encouraging words in the word of God. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. When I read those words, it made me think of what David wrote as a shepherd boy in Psalms 23. You know the verse, 23 verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and you can finish it with me, everybody say it together, I will fear no evil. I will fear no evil. I'm talking about a teenage boy here. I'm talking about a teenage boy that was out in the wilderness and, and animals are out there and uh, bears and lions were out there and, uh, and, and David said, I will not fear. Now, I want you to understand something. There really is a valley in Israel called the Valley of the Shadow of Death. And it actually is a valley that is in between Jericho and Jerusalem. And that valley is, is so deep that the only time the sun shines in that valley, when the sun is at high noon. But even then, when the sun shines into that valley, that there's still shadows in that valley. And there's a road that goes through that valley. And that road is often traveled by people going from Jerusalem to Jericho. In fact, they believe that's the same road that the, uh, uh, with a good Samaritan came and helped that man that had been beaten up by robbers and thieves. See, there were, there were caves and crevices in that valley, and the shadows made it awfully dark. And so robbers and thieves would hide in those crevices. And when, pe when merchants would come by and travelers would come by, like that man in the, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, um, they would come out, they would beat that man up. Oftentimes they would kill them and take whatever goods or money that they had. But it was also a road that shepherds would take with their flock of sheep. They would take them through that road to get them to pastures, especially during those winter months so that those uh, sheep would have some place to feed. So can you imagine? Can you imagine David? He is maybe, maybe he, he knew tomorrow, man, I'm going to be going through that valley. And David knew that going through that valley meant there may be some robbers there, maybe some animals hiding in there waiting to get those sheep. But as David was going to go through that thing, David began to write, uh, inspired by the Spirit of God, he wrote those words as he began to think about it. Yea, he said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he said, I will fear no evil. But then he gives the reason why he won't fear any evil. Was it because of his skill and his ability? He said, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. That is why the writer wrote those words in Hebrews chapter 3, uh, 13, verse 6. He said, I will, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. 
You can rest assured, my friend, and you need not fear, because you too can, as a child of God, say, for thou art with me. Oh my, so many times in the Word of God, when God's people were gripped by fear and possibly hindered by fear, God would reassure them with this great and wonderful truth to calm their fear. I think about Moses. Moses was told that he was going to be the one to be sent to deliver uh, e uh, Israel out of the bondage of Israel. And you know what? I can't blame Moses for being afraid. Could you imagine God telling you to do that? I was scared to death when I found out I was going to be a bus captain. Somebody asked me to be a bus captain. I was scared to death when I was, when God told me you're going to have to be a pastor or not have to be a pastor, but that's your calling in your life. My goodness, when I thought about the responsibility and the awesomeness of what I was going to do, I, man, the first thing was, man, I got a little bit afraid. I don't know that I can do that. I don't know if I can be that. And, and that's exactly how Moses felt. And yet in Exodus chapter 3, verse, verse uh, 10, Moses says unto God, Who am I that I should go into Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Listen, and he said, certainly, uh, and God said to him, certainly I will be with thee. See what he did? Moses was afraid. Don't blame him. And Moses said, who am I? How in the world am I going to do this? And God said, Moses, don't you fret or worry one bit. I'm going to be with you. I'll tell you what, that encouraged me. That, in fact, that has encouraged me many times through these years. I think about when the prophet Isaiah, who was preaching to Israel at a time when Israel was going through trials and tribulations and judgment by God. And during those trials, uh, Isaiah was a very encouraging voice to the remnant, to those people that decided, uh, I don't care what most of Israel is doing, we're going to stand for God, we're going to love God, we're going to live for God. And God gave to Isaiah to give to God's people these wonderful, encouraging words which bring out this truth. He said, Said to them in uh, chapter 43 verse 1 but now thus saith the Lord that created the old Jacob Jacob of course is just another nickname for Israel and he said and he that formed the old Israel fear not did you hear that fear not for I have redeemed thee. He said, I bought you. I paid for you. He said, I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine, he says. And I remind you, God's people, you are God's. God, I am his and he is mine. Amen. And then it says this, when thou pass it through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flames kindle upon thee. And he says it one more time in the next verse. He says, fear not again, for I am with thee. Oh, my friend, listen, no matter what happens, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I don't know how long this, I'm hoping, to, boy, in two, three weeks, this thing will be over. We'll get back to doing the things we love to do. We'll, be, we'll have a great service. I can't wait for that first service when everybody can come back. Man, what a time, what a spirit we're going to have. I honestly believe we're going to pack this place out on that first service. And I don't know. I don't know, but I'll tell you what, there's one thing I need, I do know, and one truth I need never lose sight of, and that is the fact that God is with us. God is with us. Boy, never lose sight of the presence of God in your life. Right now, God is with you. Mom and dad, God is with you. Young people, uh, God is with you. Teenager, God is with you. Single, God is with you. God is with every single one of us. I think about a five-year-old boy named John. He was in the kitchen. His mother was making supper. And his mother looks at Johnny and says to Johnny, Johnny, would you go into the pantry and get uh, a can of tomato soup? Now, it was one of those pantries like a closet you go into. And so Johnny looks at his mom and he says, Mom, I'm scared. That it's dark in that pantry. And Mama says, now, Johnny, Jesus will go, will be with you. Jesus will be with you when you go into that pantry. And so Johnny turns around, he kind of swallows a bit, and he starts saying, man, all right. So he starts going through that thing. He opens up the door of the pantry. He looks in there. It's awfully dark. And Johnny gets to thinking, and finally he comes up with this idea, and he says, Jesus, if you're in there, would you hand me a can of soup, please? Oh, my. 
Uh, you know what? Uh, that sometimes we're like that. We know God is real. Uh, we know that God has given us the promise that he will never leave us or forsake us. But like Johnny, we, we lose sight of the fact that he is with us. And we, we just, out of sight, what? Out of mind. And so we need to make sure that we are remembering this all the time. I, I don't know how much worse it's going to get. I don't know how much better it's going to get. But I do know this. There is one constant and one consistent that we can always count on, and that is Jesus is with us. Number two, number two, we're talking about overcoming fear here. Number two, realize that you have available God's power. I've heard this a lot too, and, and but I think I've mentioned another sermon. I, Brother Listens mentioned it, and preachers all over this country are talking about it. But you know what? We ought to talk about the power of God because there is nothing like it. It's everything that exists today is there because of the power of God. Creation came, it came about because of the power of God. But it is available for you. And I believe the power of God, understanding God's power, can help us to overcome fear. Look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 6. Notice what he says. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. You know, sometimes our fears come because we think we can't do something. And everybody here could just stop for a moment and think about things that you said, no, oh, I'm so scared because I can't do that. I can't do that. I remember watching not too long ago uh, um, something that had some uh, husband and wife that were skydiving, were going to go skydiving. And they got up there. And I'd love to do that. Man, that would be so much fun. Get up in a plane, go 10,000 feet, and jump out. Hey, man. Oh, that'd be exciting. But they were up in that plane, and they were getting ready to jump out. Husband went out, but the wife stood there. I can't do this. Oh, I can't do this. I can't do this. And the guys were up there talking to her. And talk, and, but, but here's the thing. Really, she wasn't going to do it. She was strapped to a guy. All she had to do, she didn't even have to hold on. She was strapped in. Oh, did she, hey, she, all she had to do is just let him jump off, and she was going with him. And you know what? They finally did jump off. But her fear, and, and, and I, some of you are thinking, I don't blame her. I, I wouldn't have done it either. I know that. But, but get the point. Fear sometimes causes us to, to not do something because we, I can't do that. I, I don't have the strength. I don't have the ability to do that. But you know what? The wonderful thing about this thing of knowing the power of God. And fear is legitimate. And fear is something that can grip us. But we can say when those times come. You say I can't do this. I just can't do that. I can't, I can't keep going like this. You can then say as Paul wrote there in Hebrews. The Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Now, it helps understand the context here, too, because I be, it's relevant to what, what's going on right now. Understand the context. If you go back to Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 34, it says this, For he had compassion of me and my bonds, and, listen, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. You know what that means? Spoiling means that they were robbed. And they weren't just robbed of, uh, I, I had my house broken into one time when I was in Bakersfield. Came home from a Wednesday night service, the door was busted in, uh, stuff was thrown over. Walk in the house, they took our safe and they took some other things. And uh, they missed some things too, but they kept left some things. I got to tell you, th there was some fear there. Fear that somebody actually went into our home and went through our things. Fear that somebody would actually want to do something like that. But in the case of these dear people... It wasn't just a safe. It wasn't just a few things, a computer or something like that. S some money that maybe you had put away somewhere. Everything. Everything. And the Bible says they joyfully took it. Joyfully took it. And it says knowing in yourself. Listen to this. And knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Amen. In other words, knowing that you have something they can never take away from you. Salvation. Spirit of God, spiritual riches that God gives to us. But here's the point. The bottom line of this 
is they did take joyfully the spoiling of their goods. But you know what? Life goes on after that. And I have to imagine, based on what, what the writer is teaching him in our text verses, that after everything was taken, reality sets in. And the reality could be, how are we going to make it? Where are we going to get what we need to eat? Where are we going to get the clothes we need? How are we going to get back the things that were taken from us? Could, could you imagine, just think for a moment, what if that happened to you? What if somebody came into your home and took everything you have? I'm talking things that have such memories to you and, and are, are things that parents pass down to you, pictures, and, and I'm not even talking about money. I'm not talking about computers. I'm talking about things that may be um, physically that are not worth a whole lot, but they mean a whole lot to your heart. And can you imagine everything that was of value to you was taken away from you? And you're thinking, how can I get it all back? And the truth is, they probably never get it back. And I know people that have some so, things taken from them, they never did get them back. So I can better understand why Paul was writing what he was writing there in those verses. Let me, let me read it to you again. This is what brought about these words, I believe. Hebrews 13, 5, let your, your life be without covetousness. In other words, stop wanting all those things back. And then listen to what he says, and be content, t- content with such things as you have. See, Paul knew human nature. Paul was just like anybody else. Holy Spirit impressed upon Paul. They're probably thinking about, man, we lost all that stuff. Paul says, you know what? Don't, don't think about those. Th- don't even want those things. Paul says, you, 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 you be content with what you have. And for he has said, and for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. See, the writer is helping them overcome their fears, and so he encourages them, and he gives them these words to encourage them. And he says, you can boldly say, you can boldly say, even though everything's been taken from, you can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. The Lord's going to help me. I'm not going to fear what man can do to me. See, the application that we can make is right along with what's happening today. We should not fear what this pandemic is doing or could do. We should not fear the damage that may come up. We should not even fear the economy and how it may affect each and every single one of us. I mean, we need to plan and we need to prepare. And certainly there is a a certain amount of concern there. But I'm saying we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be wringing our hands and saying, oh, my soul, what are we going to do? What's the church going to do? Man, I don't, how am I going to get paid? How am I going to do this? And those are all legitimate concerns. And I'm not belittling any, any of that. All, I'm, I'm just trying to help you to overcome fear. I'm trying to help you that fear doesn't grip you, that, where you cannot be the Christian you need to be. And I'm saying the Lord is our helper. God has power to heal people. God has, God has a, a power to be able to take care of us, meeting our needs and, and providing the things that we need. We should be content with what we have right now. And the truth is we got so much. Remember what David said concerning going through the valley of the shadow of death? In Psalms 23, 4, let me read it to you again. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Listen to the rest. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Did you know that the rod and staff actually were the same thing? And that actually was describing two different uh, ends of that rod? You see, the, the rod aspect of the blunt end of that rod was actually a weapon. That is what the shepherd would use to poke and to kill and to uh, ward off wolves or whatever the animals may be. That was his weapon. And that weapon was what he used to protect the sheep and protect himself. That's why when David went up against Goliath and said to Saul, Saul, that, that giant is, is nothing, he said. Listen, I've killed animals. I've protected the sheep with my rod. And he said, I'm going to go out there and God's going to help me to do that too. 
And may I say to you, in these days, we should not be afraid. The devil's going to try to get you to be fearful. The devil wants you to worry and fret about all these things. But listen to me. Let me give you this hope. It doesn't matter what's going on. Remember, you can relax and you can rest in the protection of God. David said, I will fear no evil. I'm not going to be afraid. I love over there, in the, uh, I can't remember the exact psalm. I love what David, David said. There could be thousands of the enemy all around me. All around me, ready to get me. And, 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 and I'm not quoting here. I'm quoting as an old preacher used to say. But he said, I'm still going to sleep like a baby. <laughs> Amen. Thousands of soldiers around. David said, I could still sleep good. You know why? Because David didn't have, you know why David didn't have any fear? Because he, he realized that the provision of God's power was there. He realized that the presence of God was there. If God wanted him to die through those soldiers, then that's the will of God and he's going to accept it. But he knew who was holding him in his hands. And that's what I'm saying to every single one of us here this morning. So, the rod, rod is the blunt end, that's the, that's the weapon. That brings protection. But the staff was the other end. And at that end was a crook. And I'm not talking about a guy that comes in and takes your things now. I'm talking about a crook. I'm talking about the end of that rod that is a like curve, like a hook. A crook is a hook. And, and that was used... To get them, the sheep, out of trouble. A sheep could, would, would, would uh, maybe fall into a ditch. And it was the crook that he would reach down and, and put it and use it to pull that sheep or that lamb back up. It was the crook that he used. If a, if a lamb was falling behind, he would take that crook and he would get a hold of that lamb and pull that, pull that lamb back up into the herd. Because if you wander off from the, cro from, if he wandered off from the flock, uh, some animal will get him. See, the, the crook was given to us to keep us safe. That's what David would say. David said, I don't have to fear because my shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd and uh, he will come and he'll help me. Man, I may feel like I'm falling in a ditch. I may feel like I'm in a pit, but I can boldly say the Lord is my helper. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Ah, it reminds me of a boy who was quoting Psalms 23, that verse. And of course, Psalm 23, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And that little boy quoted a little bit wrong. He said, he said, the Lord is my shepherd, and that's all I need. And I cannot tell you something, he had it right, really. That's all you need. You've got your shepherd, and he's got, he's got the rod with the blunt end. He's going to protect you, but he's also got the crook. And when you need help, he can reach down and pull you up. And get you back up again. Oh, you can boldly say that. You'll be in a pit one of these days. But your hope is that you, can, you know the Lord Jesus Christ. Your hope is that he has that rod and that staff. To not only protect you, but to provide for you. And to help you. Oh, I think of that verse in Psalms 40 verse 2. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit. Out of the miry clay. And set my feet upon a rock. And established my going. How did he do that? Ah, with the crook. He took that thing and he could take, by the way, that's what he did at salvation. He got you up out of that miry clay. He pulled you up with his staff and he put your feet on a solid rock. That's Jesus Christ. And he established your going. Boy, we got a wonderful shepherd this morning. Boy, we have a wonderful God this morning. Boy, we have a wonderful Savior this morning. I'm so glad I'm saved today. I'm so glad that I know him. I was reminded as I was going through this. I'm reminded of an old poem. Everybody's heard it. Everybody's heard it. But I guarantee it's been a while probably since you read it and thought about it. Uh, the title of the poem is called Footsteps in the Sand. And I thought about that poem as I was preparing this sermon and going through this truth right here. C let me read it to you. We got time. Uh, one night I dreamed a dream. As I was walking along the beach with my Lord, across the dark sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to me and one to my Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. By the way, remember, those, the Lord's with you. 
That's a beautiful picture of that wonderful truth. The Lord's walking right with you, friend. And then he said, I look back at the footprints in the sand. I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me, so I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I just, Lord, you said once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why. When I needed you the most, you would leave me. And he whispered, my precious child, I love you, will never leave you. Never, ever during your trials and testings. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Boy, that's what I'm saying this morning. You've got the power of God. You've got God, God's ability not only to protect you, but to help you and take care of you. Praise God that when fear would take us down, the Lord will take us up and lift us up. Number three, renew your faith and trust in the promises of God. Renew your faith and your trust in the promises of God. Can I tell you, uh, Brother Listen preached on there's some good things that can come out of this, and we've talked about that several times. We'd, I got to preach at the rest home the other day. They called me, and I canceled it all. They said, we, we'd like you to come and preach, and, but I, you're going to have to be outside in the gazebo, and they're going to be along the building and the windows looking at me. And that was such a blessing. That was such a joy to be able to do that. And to preach to those dear people. I was like a radio broadcaster. I had my cell phone and, and I played some gospel music. And I say, and now I'm going to play for you. Take, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. I said, come on, sing along. And I'd put the mic toward my cell phone and they played the song. And I'd look in the windows and we'd see, I'd see those dear elderly ladies and elderly men looking out the window. And I could, I could see them, they clapping their hands and they were smiling like this. And I was out there smiling and singing along with it. Man, that was a blessing. Some good things can come out of this thing. Some great, hey, we're doing videos now. We're going to be able to have audio and, uh, and eventually live stream on our website. Folks keep tell, asking, Pastor, when are we going to get it? When are we going to get it? Well, you know what? God had to bring all this into our life so we could get it. Good things. Good things can come from this. But the greatest, one of the greatest things can come from this is that you can renew your faith and your trust in the promises of God. Oh, let me give you a verse, Psalm 56, verse number 3. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. That really is what Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6 are saying. Uh, uh, a great story with this verse. A lady went up to D.L. Moody one time and, and said to him, Mr. Moody, I, 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 I have, this is a verse I use all the time. She said, what time I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. Mr. Moody wasn't trying to be uh, hurt or anything, but he said, I've got one better than that, he said. He said, I, he said, Isaiah 12, verse 2, I will trust and not be afraid. I will trust and not be afraid. Now, truth is, those two verses have different contexts. But the truth is, probably we're living the verse she gave more than the verse that he gave. He said, I will trust and not be afraid. She said, what time am I afraid? I will trust in thee. And that's probably how we are most of the time. We get fear and then we say, you know what? Hey, Joe. Trust in the Lord. God's got all these wonderful promises. Some have said there's over 350 promises, one for every single day. And I think that's what God's saying to us. I believe this. I challenge you this morning. Don't let your fears, or rather, let your fears drive you to trust in God and his promises. And so, Psalms 56 verse 4 says, In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Let's face it, none of us knows what's going to happen. But don't let your fear rob you of the future, the blessings that God has for the future. I read about a man that was really nervous about getting on an airplane. And so he'd already got his ticket. He was there in, in the airport. And he looked over it and it says you can buy uh, insurance so if anything happens to you, um, you can, it'll provide for your family. Guy got to looking at it. Wasn't that expensive? He thought, you know what? 
that, that's a good idea. I think I'll do that. So he did. He bought the insurance and still had time after he bought the insurance. He decided he was going to go get something to eat before he got on his flight. So he looked around and he found a Chinese restaurant. Went over to that Chinese restaurant, sat down, he bought it. And of course, like many Chinese restaurants, guess what they give you first? Fortune cookies. And so he came, they came with a fortune cookie, and he opened up that fortune cookie, and here's what it said. Your recent investment will pay big dividends. Oh, my. I, I don't know about you, but that would concern me a little bit. I'm not superstitious or funny like that, but come on. I might get a little afraid there. Wouldn't you agree with that? But what we need to do in times like that or times we fear, we need to just renew our faith, renew our trust, and go to God through the word of God and say, Lord, this is what you are, and these are the promises that you made. I know, oh, I noticed the other day, I was reading Psalms 80. Man, I love this. The psalmist wrote three times in Psalms 80, turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Three times. In that psalm. And it's the only place it was. And so I thought, I want to find out what this, is going, what's, what this psalm is all about. What's it about? God was, was bringing some judgment. God was allowing some trials into their life. In fact, one of the verses said this. Uh, said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou be angry against the prayer of thy people? So evidently, this was, this was God chastening. God was bringing some things into their life. But you know what? You know what they, they prayed? They said, Lord, turn us. You know, that's been my prayer. I'm not saying this is the judgment of God. I, I'm not saying that. But here's what I'm praying. I'm saying, Lord, as we are waiting on you and as we are trusting you, Lord, turn us now. Turn us back to you. I'm praying that some of Christians that have been out of church and some Christians that have not been in their Bible and have not been praying, I'm praying that God would turn them. Turn them. Turn them to trust, trust him again. Turn them to seek his face again. Turn them to get back into church again. Get faithful again. Read their Bible again. I love that it says, cause thy face to shine and we shall be saved. You know what today? You know what would have happened today if none of this had happened? Today would have been our revival. Today, Brother Souter would have got up here and we'd have been, we'd have, last week we'd have had cottage prayer meetings and we'd have been meeting uh, Monday night, Tuesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. We'd been praying for revival and we'd be here and I believe this auditorium had been packed and Brother Souter had been preaching and we'd been praying. So Lord, send revival. But can I tell you something? We don't need to be in an auditorium that revival. We don't need a preacher to come to our church and preach for a week to have revival. Hey, this could be used to bring revival in our heart because what's revival? It's getting us back to God, getting us back to trusting Him, and trusting in the promises of God. Lord, turn us again. That's my prayer. Renew your faith. Renew your trust. By the way, that's what revival is. That, would, that is one of the greatest cures for fear, is renewing your trust and renewing your faith in God and His promises. Read this story. Let me read it to you. Some years ago in Armenia, there was a tremendous earthquake that registered 8.2 on the Richter scale. A little boy named Armand had gone to school that day. Armand had a close relationship with his father. In fact, his father had said, Armand, just remember, no matter what happens, your dad will always be there for you. That day, Armand went to school, and he was in class when an earthquake hit. And the school crumbled and fell as buildings all across the city crumbled in one of the most, earth, most wor worst earthquakes in the history of Armenia. Little Armand's father rushed to the scene. He was told that all the survivors had already been rescued and his son was not among the survivors. So, so gripped by fear and desperation, he began to claw at the rubble and the debris. They begged him and told him it was no use. There is, there's no hope. But for 38 hours, he went to the place where his son's classroom was, and he clawed with his hands. He dug, and he moved rocks and debris and stones until one moment he heard something. And he wiped away the dust and debris, and he saw the face of his little boy. Five or six little children were in a crawl space. Little Armand said to his buddies, I told you, my father would come. I told you my father wouldn't forget me. 
he let his buddies get out first, and then little Armand was lifted out by his dad. He put his arms around his daddy, and he said, Daddy, I knew you would come for me. Daddy, I knew you wouldn't forget me. I knew you would come. My friend, you may feel like you're going through a dark valley right now. You may feel like David. I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death. That doesn't mean you're going to die. It just means I'm scared. I'm worried. I'm fearful. But could I remind you this morning that God is your father and Jesus is your shepherd. And he can and will, if you let him, overcome your fear. He'll overcome your fear if you'll just remind yourself of the presence of God. He'll overcome your fear if you'll just realize, hey, God's got more than enough power to work this all out. God has the power to provide and take care of us. And he'll overcome your fear if you'll get back. And boy, we'll have more time. We get to stay at home um, uh, order. You know what? It's going to give us more time to read the Bible. More time to get our journal out and get a pen in our hand while it's reading the Bible. And, and I challenge you, write down every promise of God you come to. And say, what is this promising? And just reassure your heart. Renew, renew your faith and your trust in God and his promises. I hope that if you're fretting and fearful right now, I hope you'll kneel right there at your couch or wherever you may be and get on your knees and say, Father, forgive me for fretting. Forgive me for fearing. I know you're with me. I know you're, you know what's going on. And I know you, you're going to take care of everything. And I know that your word reassures me over and over again that I need not fear. I will trust and not be afraid. Hey, God bless you. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the afternoon. I look forward to you hearing the message for tonight. You don't want to miss tonight's message. Boy, you got to, you got to hear it. Truths, truths that you can live and die by. Truths that you can live and die. Boy, please listen to that tonight. And I pray God will bless it and use it in your heart, in your life. God bless you. I love you and praying for you.